of space. Thank you. <laughs> this is the chief of space operations for the U.S. Space Force, um, and um, you know it's uh, it's pretty amazing to think that it's been about seventy five years since the U.S. created a new service, which was the the Air Force spun out of what was the Army Air Force in post World War II. Um, and uh, this is just a rare thing that happens uh, inside of our Department of Defense when threats and technology changes. And, and I think, um, you know, the creation of the Space Force, which I'm, I'm sure General Raymond will talk about, is kind of an indication of everything we've t been talking about in this class, um, about the new changes in technology, the changes in threats, um, the speed at which all those are happening simultaneously and our ability to kind of stand up an organization that will allow us to focus on what's essentially the high ground for the Department of Defense. And um, uh, so General, welcome to the class and, um, and uh, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, thanks uh, very much. And I, I greatly, uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to, to join you this evening. Um, you know, it, it is a shame that, that we're having to do this virtually. I would love to be there with you in person. Uh, I always get a lot out of these uh, conversations. I actually usually get a lot more out of it than I give. And so uh, what I plan on doing, if it's okay with the, with the students, I'll, I'll give some thoughts to, to generate a, a good dialogue, a good Q&A session back and forth. I'm happy to talk about any topic. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited about the subject of your class. I think, uh, uh, the Space Force is a really... Uh, will help bring to life many of the things that you're talking about. Uh, and, and I'm eager to, eager to get your thoughts. Yeah, I've, I've been in, uh, in the Air Force for, um, since 1984. Uh, so what's, you know, 36 years or so. And I've been in the Space Force for about 10 months. I, uh, last year, the president signed the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the birth certificate, if you will, for the United States Space Force. And I've been privileged and honored uh, to lead a, a group of folks, uh, some very uh, sharp space professionals in establishing this force. It, it was, as was mentioned, haven't done this since uh, 1947, uh, when, we, when uh, the Air Force uh, separated, if you will, from the Army. There's no checklist on how to do this. Uh, there's really no uh, history to go back to, uh, but we're, uh, we are uh, uh, moving out with great speed uh, to be able to establish this force. And again, really, really proud of, of the work that, that, that the team has done. And I'll share some of that with you. But you might be saying, well, why, why do we need a space force? I'd suggest to you that the strategic environment that we face today is rapidly changing. And that uh, the, 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 um, uh, the nature of warfare, if you will, is changing. And my, you know, we've been involved in the space business in, in the military since the 50s. I mean, space was great power competition. And, and uh, what started out as nation state versus nation state, if you will, now has evolved to where we have students building satellites. Um, uh, but we started out and we you know, started in, uh, developing uh, capabilities as part of that great power competition within the Soviet Union. Um, I'll, I'll highlight a, a few uh, demarcation points, if you will, of, of where I think there were some significant shifts, but Back in uh, 1991, uh, there was the uh, went to the command at the time, the Air Force Space Command, which was stood up in 1982, um, was about nine years old, and, and we went to war uh, with Des in Desert Storm uh, uh, to evict uh, uh, Iraq out of Kuwait, and uh, that was the, really the first war. You'll hear that war referred to as the first space war, and it's really the the, the way I describe it is the first war where space was integrated into theater operations. And so you saw back then, uh, or you've seen back then, because most of you weren't alive when that happened, but uh, uh, you saw uh, U.S. and coalition forces do a left hook in, through the desert at night uh, on a featureless terrain uh, uh, to maneuver uh, against uh, the adversary. And, and the way we did that was using a, a GPS constellation. And it was a very, very beginning stages of the GPS constellation. It wasn't even fully full up and operating. We used, there was, back then there was, um, Iraq was uh, launching Scud missiles and we used strategic capabilities that we have to detect, strategic missile warning capabilities that we have to detect uh, ICBM class missiles. And we used them innovatively to be able to 
give warning on much smaller smaller rockets. We saw for the first time the innovations of precision. Um, and so uh, since that time, since 1991, my whole career has basically been focused on integrating space capabilities and everything that we do as a, as a joint and coalition force. And today there's nothing that we do, absolutely nothing that isn't enabled by space. Whether that's um, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, I was privileged to be stationed in Japan in 2011 when the big earthquake and nuclear reactor and tsunami and nuclear reactor disaster occurred. And, and we use space capabilities uh, integrated into those operations as you would expect. And uh, all the way up through, uh, obviously, conflict. Uh, and we use them today uh, very, very, uh, again, integrated into all that we do. Um, and so that was 1991. And so from 1991 to probably the, the, the next uh, demarcation, if you will, it was 2007. And that's when we saw China shoot a missile and blow up one of their own satellites and blew it into about 3,000 pieces of debris. And that was the kind of the call that uh, space uh, may no longer be the peaceful, benign domain that, that we hope it would be and that, that we wished it uh, would be. Uh, and that we have to not just worry about taking capabilities and integrating those capabilities uh, into operations, but we also have to be worried about protecting and defending those capabilities. And so that, that, that those threats have continued and, and today, in, a, in this setting, I'll say that uh, everything from reversible jamming of GPS satellites and communication satellites to laser threats to uh, on-orbit activities that are concerning uh, uh, to uh, cyber threats to, again, missiles that can be launched from the ground that, that can blow up a satellite. And so there's a whole, whole spectrum of threats uh, that, that, we're, uh, that we're concerned about. And as we have worked so hard to integrate space capabilities uh, into everything that we do, they've become very, very important to us, as you would imagine. And it's not just important to us as a military. Space, as you know, is important to us as Americans and, and, and uh, not just us, but to humans all over, all over the planet. And, and our way of life is really fueled by those capabilities, as is our way of war. And so uh, because of this changing strategic environment, the United States over the course of the past um, few years has been in a dialogue on what's the best way to organize for space. Uh, space had, had long been part of the Air Force, and the thought was we really need to elevate space to a level commensurate with its importance to our national security. And so um, in, in the Department of Defense, we're kind of organized two ways. One, one way, one part of the organization is focused on, on war fighting. And that's uh, uh, what combatant commands do. And so you'll hear about CENTCOM or Indo-PACOM or UCOM or, or Strategic Command or, or NORTHCOM. Those are combatant commands. And so uh, there used to be a command called US Space Command. It was stood down uh, shortly after 9-11. Uh, and then um, we took space and we moved it underneath U.S. Strategic Command. Uh, and we've been underneath U.S. Strategic Command until last year. In August of, of last year, 2019, we reestablished that command to take it from a component of U.S. Strategic Command and make it its own command. Um, and so um, that was one part of that equation. And I was privileged to plan that command and then be its first commander. Uh, the law said I could, I could, uh, oh, I got uh, nominated and, and, and confirmed and I was the commander of U.S. Space Command. Then a couple months later, uh, a few months later in December, uh, the United States decided to elevate what we call the organized train and equip part of the military. That's what services do. That's what Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and, and now the Space Force. And to elevate space from a major command underneath the United States Air Force and, and elevate that to its own independent service. And so the law said at that time that I could serve as the commander of both of those uh, uh, for up to a year. And so I served as the commander of US Space Command and the Space Force Chief until this past August when we split the hats. And now there's a, a, a new commander for US Space Command and I'm solely focused on the organized training equipped part of, of the Space Force. And so let me, uh, so I don't tag up all the time here. Let me give you a few thoughts on what an independent service needs to do and kind of some of the things that we're thinking through. And then I'm going to open it up. I'll, I'll uh, quit talking and open up for a, 
for a dialogue with you. But um, as an independent service, I think there's kind of five things you have to do. The first thing you have to do is you have to develop your own people. And so uh, that's that's obviously a, a big piece of what we're what we're focusing on. We're, we're building this service. I, I The way I talk about it is we're inventing this service because we don't want to just uh, build what we had. We want to we want to invent something new that purpose built for this domain uh, 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 to be able to get after the challenges that, that this domain uh, uh, provides us. Uh, the, the second thing that you have to do is you have to have your own doctrine. And so we just published our, our first uh, independent space force doctrine, if you will, called space power. And, and if you have an opportunity to Google that and read it, it it'd be worth reading. It's a, it's, it's a, not a long read, but I think it's really well done. Uh, and, and I think uh, provides for a good basis for an intellectual conversation. Uh, the third thing that you have to do is you have to have your own budget. And so we took all the dollars that were associated for space from the Air Force and brought it into the Space Force. And we just completed what we call the POM process to this year to provide as an independent service to, to go through that, that funding process and just uh, submitted that to, to the department here uh, over the last couple of months. Uh, the other thing you have to do is you have to do, you have to design your forces. And it's called, we call it force design. Uh, I, can you all still see me and hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. I, don't know, I don't know what happened here, but let me, hold on a second, let me hit a button. Hopefully that doesn't screw up. I'll make you, know, you I'll make you I I'm sorry, just give me make you coast. I apologize, General. Um, there, you should be good to go. Um, I've lost you. I, I've, I got. Dan. Dan. Hello. Hello. Let's let's Dan? mute folks. Yeah, Amy, I'll call you back. Hold on a second. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I thought that was someone else. I apologize. <laughs> there you go. That was my daughter. <laughs> That's why I couldn't. Uh, she can talk uh, as long as that's really good. That shows you what a technological dinosaur I am. So all of a sudden the screen went blank and I hit a accept and it was my daughter. Uh, so I'm back. Um, uh, so force design is where I was. And so uh, one of the things that we're working is how do you, what is, uh, um, how do you design that force uh, to, to be able to operate in a contested environment and to drive unity of effort across the department to reduce uh, duplication of effort to uh, enhance our speed and and uh, and to reduce costs, and then the other thing you have to do is present those forces then to a, a war fighting commander, and we're working the force presentation piece of that as well. As we're thinking through that, there's several lines of effort that we're uh, we're focusing on. One, we're we're working to build this service as a very lean and agile service. Uh, we don't want to be big and slow. We want to go fast. The domain that we're that we operate in is. Um, uh, you know, huge. It's a hundred kilometer. The the AOR, the space AOR, is is defined in the Department of Defense as a hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface and higher. And and so that that vastness of space and the speed of which things move uh, is significant. And so we want to be small to be able to go fast. Um, and I can talk to you about that as we go as we go forward. We also uh, want to be able to build capabilities. Uh, uh, at speed and to acquire capabilities at speed. Uh, and so that's another area that we're really focusing on. Uh, another area that we're focusing on is to develop this service as the first digital service. And when we mean that, uh, we're trying to build this to have um, a digital headquarters, uh, a, a, a more fluent digital workforce. So everybody that comes into the Space Force will, will learn coding, if you will, and, and get speak a second, second language and that being, uh, computer language, uh, and then also uh, to adopt digital engineering standards as our as our standard for uh, uh, acquiring. Uh, we're also focusing on partnerships. We really believe that with this service, we can develop um, uh, a, a a closer tie to several different folks. One, our allied partners uh, uh, around the globe. Uh, two, commercial industry and really being on the cutting edge of, of innovative industries going forward. Uh, 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 three uh, partners with, with the greater national security enterprise plus uh, civil, civil uh, space as well. And so we're really focusing on developing those partnerships. And I'll be happy to talk about that. And then we need to develop 
space experts that understand how to operate in a contested domain. Uh, I, I, the example that I use, um, if you are on a uh, airplane, every, everybody know who Sully is, the, you know, the, air, the pilot that was flying the plane from, uh, took off out of New York and ingested birds and landed in the ocean or the water in the, in the river. Um, you know, he was a spectacular pilot. If I'm flying on a commercial airliner, I want Sully to be my pilot, right? Because he's gonna, he's gonna, we may lose our engines, but I'm gonna live. Um, the challenge is, uh, you know, in this, that Sully wasn't operating in a threatened environment. Uh, and, and, a, and a fighter pilot, on the other hand, is also a good pilot, but he's trained differently. He is trained to operate in a contested domain. And we've got the world's best space operators, uh, but we've largely trained them because of the environment to, to operate in a benign domain. And we're making that shift to, to train those folks to, to, uh, to, to operate in a contested domain and then to train more traditional war fighters to also have a better understanding of space. And th so those are the kinds of some of the things we're thinking through. It's really an exciting time and privilege, absolutely privileged to have this opportunity to, to lead this service. Uh, I, we're making some great progress. If you had told me we've made it uh, this much progress in such a, a short period of time in just 10 months, uh, it's pretty incredible, the, the work that we've done. And, and I'm happy to talk about any of that and or any other thing that's on your mind. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And, and with that, uh, I'm going to go silent on this end and uh, just take your questions. Great. The General, thank you for, for that uh, great introduction and, and summary. And in fact, you, uh, I, I think, answered at least half the questions we had teed up. Um, uh, normally, the teaching team uh, uh, starts with a set of questions and then the students. Um, but I'm going to defer to the uh, most senior person in the room, uh, Admiral Ellis, who had a had a question. And uh, Admiral Ellis, if, you, if you'd like to ask yours, uh, yours first? Well, I, I appreciate the difference uh, uh, for age and lack of hair, if nothing else. But uh, Jay already touched on it. Uh, as an old sailor, I love ships. And I wanted to ask you to speak about two of them briefly. And you did already. The first is the role of partnerships, as, as you indicated, you know, be they inter service, inter agency, international, or with civil and commercial entities. And the second ship is uh, where another area where you excel is leadership. And how do you see the role of the Space Force in leading a global effort to enhance stability, deterrence, and promote positive norms of behavior in space? In other words, conflict in space is not preordained. Uh, and how do you see your role in, uh, in that uh, deterrent or prevention uh, phase? Yeah, for, uh, for so first, uh, both good questions. And first of all, let me start out saying you have a great haircut. So I appreciate your haircut. <laughs> <laughs> same oh, barber. There you go. Yeah, same barber. Um, so on the on the first ship, the partnership piece, we're working that really hard. That's probably one of the things I'm most proud of is the the partnerships that we've developed. Uh, historically, we have not um, had the on the military space side. We have not had the partnerships that. Uh, because we really didn't need them. It, it was a benign, peaceful domain as long as you could launch a satellite and it didn't, it survived launch and what we called infant mortality and it didn't hit something in space, you're good to go. Uh, that's clearly not the case today. And so we've been working very hard to develop international partnerships and largely those international partnerships have been with our, our Five Eyes partners, uh, plus France, Germany, Japan. Um, we also have a significant amount of data sharing partnerships across, across the uh, the world as well. Uh, uh, we're the best in the world at space and we're even better, we're stronger together with our partners. Um, we started out largely in data sharing. We've progressed now to actually operating with our partners. Uh, we've, when we stood up US Space Command, we designed a component that's com called the Combined Space Force Component Command. Combined meaning it's, it's uh, an organization that has our, our partners with us. Um, and uh, that was a first. And so we see great value in those partnerships and not just one-way data sharing, but two-way partnerships. We, we train together, we exercise together, we operate together, we develop programs uh, and capabilities together. And we really believe that there's uh, significant advantages of that going forward. Uh, and it, our partnership with the National Reconnaissance Office has never been better. Uh, I really hold that partnership in high regard. Uh, we operate in the same domain. We share the same strategy, same concept of operations. 
we share capabilities, we share people, we share operation centers, and we're working very closely with, with those. And then we, we work very cl close with commercial industry as well. Uh, we, on our operations floor out at Vandenberg uh, a few years ago, I stood up a commercial integration cell where we actually have commercial operators on the floor with us. Uh, when you came out to Vandenberg, Joe, uh, we were just starting that uh, at that time. Uh, it's really paying dividends, allow us to share information back and forth with commercial industry. I really believe, Admiral Ellis, that uh, one of our big ideas is to work an even tighter relationship with commercial industry uh, across the board. And I think with a service uh, like the Space Force, we have an opportunity to do that. And we're gonna put a lot of thought on that going forward. Uh, on the other uh, part of your question uh, on, I'll, I'll just talk, first of all, norms of behavior. Uh, you know, is a, is a, so first of all, let me state, and I say this in every speech I give, that space is a warfighting domain, just like air, land, and sea. Uh, the, you know, I, that's something that I say in every speech. I, I, it, it's true, it's become a warfighting domain. And then I also say, and I, I need to be very clear on this, we do not want to get into a conflict that begins or extends into space. We want to deter that from happening. And so um, we are working very hard with our partners to develop uh, norms of behavior to address um, what is safe and professional behavior in space. We want to uh, develop those by by demonstrating good behavior on how we act, and we do that. We are very transparent. We share data uh, broadly across the globe. Uh, we've got uh, uh, working very closely with our partners on on coming up with those. When we talk about deterrence, a lot of people talk about space deterrence, and I don't I don't talk about space deterrence. I just talk about deterrence. I think it's it's just deterrence and space can be a part of that. I think space can help amplify deterrence messages and, and the deterrence calculus of, of uh, imposing costs and denying benefits. And so um, like all combatant commands have a deterrence role, uh, US Space Command does as well and the capabilities that we provide help feed into that, that deterrence. But we're working all of that uh, in partnership with, in, with, uh, in, a close partnership with our with our partners, and I think that also adds to the deterrence capability. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, General. Um, Joe, do you want to do you want to ask the first uh, teaching team question, or? Sure. Uh, actually, I was gonna. I, I can, but you, you know, General, you mentioned that the partnering with uh, commercial industry, and we we have we want to make Bucky maybe sing for his supper. But Bucky, is that something you might want to kick off with, and I, I can follow? Well, uh, doing commercial stuff with the Space Force is probably the easiest of, of the services because the, uh, the, the culture, all the things that General Raymond already spoke to. I, um, I will say one thing though, uh, you know, and just like Raj, you know, I grew up in the Air Force uh, flying airplanes and, uh, and I was a butter bar lieutenant during the first Gulf War. Uh, so I remember all that, uh, all, the, all those days. But the, uh, if I were entering the military today, uh, there's no question that I would be, I would want to go into the Space Force. And I, and I think this is, there's a tremendous draw there, uh, not because where, we, where we've been, but because of where we're going. And unlike 1947, you know, um, you know the uh, United States and its allies concluded a world war and had a dominant position. Uh, today, we, we're in a renewed era of uh, great powers competition. And, uh, and, uh, and that competition's breathing down our neck in some areas, uh, uh, whether it's uh, commercial, civil, or even some military technologies. So, they, so the speed, the agility, um, the, the ability to look at problems differently are all gonna be so instrumental uh, going into the, into the future. And uh, so uh, yeah, we were, um, Raj will remember the Secretary of Defense created DIU uh, in order to kind of disrupt uh, the uh, the thinking and the thought process and and to influence and broaden the scope of acquisition. Um, so we don't talk about a national, uh, in, uh, rather a defense industrial base today as much as we talk about a national security innovation base, which includes all the valuable things we get from the primes, but also the wealth of innovation that we that we can leverage from the commercial community. And uh, but it, it's it's tricky uh, to bring that stuff in. You have to be one to take some risk. You have to be able to create some partnerships. Uh, General Raymond's organization created a, uh, an organization called the Space Enterprise Consortium, which forms a happy marriage of disparate uh, innovators, uh, big and small, to tackle problems. 
so so I, I think that um, uh, you know uh, you know from from um, from the back seat here, I would I would give the Space Force uh, two thumbs up. Uh, I think they're doing all the right stuff, and uh, and you know talent management is everything. Uh, the team building is huge. I love the fact that they're going to try to keep it a lean, mean, smaller organization, so it it, it doesn't uh, get sucked into the uh, you know the the inertia of the, of the larger department, and. Uh, and so uh, that's that's what I would add. Uh, so just uh, we're ha happy to be a, a wingman, uh, you know, uh, to support their efforts in any which way that uh, we can. Thanks, uh, Great. Yeah. Uh, so Raj, uh, uh, how about you? Question for the general? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, general Raymond, um, uh, really appreciate your comments on on how you know, and because it's a new service, you've had the opportunity to to build new. Uh, processes uh, over the last 10 months. One of the things we've really uh, focused here on this class and the students will do in their projects is um, how to harness the technology innovation and the talent that is coming out of places like, like Silicon Valley. And so I thought I might ask you to, two, two questions. Um, on the talent side, uh, you know, you listed as your number one thing in uh, train, uh, train and equip. What are some of the more unique approaches you're taking to try to, to bring in talent from commercial companies, engineers, short periods of time, civilian reserve, et cetera. What are some of the things that you're trying that we haven't seen in the rest of the department that you think are success? So that's question one, so I'm asking two. And the other question is, um, again, you've had a great effort to perform acquisition and work with commercial companies. How are you tackling the, the classification issue, right? Because many of the things that you do in space for good reason uh, are in a highly classified world. How do you work with 10 guys in a garage out here in the Valley? Yeah, uh, they're, they're both uh, really good questions. I think on the, on the human capital front, uh, we've developed a human capital plan uh, that's really innovative. And you know, for the, we've only, we're only 10 months old. And so we, you know, we, we built the plan. We want to, we want to be able to bring people in from, from industry, uh, laterally into the, into the service. Uh, we want to be able to, to send people from, uh, the space force and have them work at NASA for a while, have them may go work at, you know, a, a, a company, uh, and come back. Uh, uh, we want to infuse, we want to do things differently. And so we built this vision for this, uh, human capital plan that gets after that. There's a lot of authorities that, that we have that we can use that um, traditionally are underutilized, if you will, and we want to use all of them. Uh, our first 10 months has largely been about um, building all the processes to get people into the Space Force. And so, you know, on 20 December, when the president signed the law, uh, I was patient zero, as people call me, and I was you know, the first one. Uh, and then we you know, got a, a command uh, senior enlisted advisor, we, that was number two. And we got 86 cadets coming out of the academy. Uh, that was 88. And then we held boards and who in the Air Force is going to apply to come in. And, and you know, we had, you know, uh, don't quote me on this, but, you know, I think roughly about 9,000 applicants for 7,000 positions. Uh, and, and so we plan on being very selective of who, of who we bring in. So we've gotten through all that work and process thing. Now what we're looking at is how do you build on that and do the innovative pieces and, and implementing this human capital plan to be the model for, for others going forward is, is what we're really beginning to focus on now. We built the plan, we built the strategy, and now we're, we're focusing on, on implementing that. And I've had some really good conversations with, with leaders in the business uh, and in industry uh, on how they do it to see what we can do to be innovative. And I, I'm excited about it. I think, I think of all the things that we're doing, that might be the biggest idea that we have that's going to generate uh, really uh, important value. Uh, so that was uh, uh, your first question. And uh, classification on the second question, uh, it's a it's a uh, an issue that that we're working through. And you're you're right to identify it. We uh, space has largely been in the classified realm. In my opinion, it's overly classified, and we're working hard to develop a strategy. Again, if your if your goal is to deter conflict. Um, you you want to be able to message any potential adversary to be able to change your calculus. It's kind of hard to do that when you can't talk about things. So we're 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 building the strategy to be able to do that. Uh, and I 
would expect uh, uh, that there's going to be some progress on that front. It's, it's, uh, we, we think there's some opportunities. And, and with the, and this is a really bad word to use in space, but the explosion of commercial space capabilities are out there. <laughs> we can talk a lot about this at an unclassified level. Uh, and we're excited for, for that uh, going forward. But it's an issue for us, and it's one that we're, we're working hard on. Thank you, Jenna. And my question is the only thing between you and uh, the students' questions. So, uh, so let me get mine out quickly. Um, I think when we chatted in June, you were standing up your your, your staff and uh, and uh, and taking a look at the types of organizations. And and I think, as our students know, you know, the staff functions are, you know, called Napoleonic uh, for a reason. Is that uh, you know they follow the traditional models of, of about how staffs are organized. And Space Force was kind of looking at, uh, at and maybe doing uh, uh, things the same to keep aligned with the Pentagon and maybe things different. Um, can you share any of how that ended up uh, with the class and why? Yeah, so um, we've done, you know, when, when uh, in December, when, when I started off with this, uh, the Air Force had done some planning leading up to it. And the plan was to have over a thousand people on the staff. And I thought that was gonna be too clunky, too big and, and too slow. And so we've done a lot of work and we've had a lot of help, uh, including, including your, uh, your uh, instructor here, uh, Steve, helping us uh, think through some innovative ways to do that. We've whittled that staff size down to, to, to less than 600. Uh, and, and again, to, to be able to move at speed. But however, having said that, you have to be able to operate inside the Department of Defense. And there's a little bit of overhead that's required just to be able to do that and to do that well. Uh, you also need to, you know, you, somebody needs to be able to pick up the phone book, if you will, and be able to understand who they're talking to. And, and you don't want to get too different that people don't know how to plug into you. So really we came up, uh, what we did was we came up with some really critical functions that we had to have to operate inside the Department of Defense. And, and you know, for example, if you're going to be a member of the Joint Chiefs, you have to have a three-star that can, that can interact for you on your behalf with the other services. And so we stood up a, a, a three-star called the S3. We combined that with some other functions because we don't, didn't want to have a, we wanted to have a reduced uh, leadership uh, structure. And so we, we made it the S236, if you will. So combine functions under one leader um, to be able to uh, do that. And then we also call them the chief operating officer. And so we kind of have a hybrid approach where we have the the S3, so everybody understands that nomenclature inside the Pentagon, but we also call him the chief operating officer to try to drive a different, uh, a different uh, mindset for that, for that uh, position. We've done the same thing on the resourcing side, um, and we've done the same thing for our human capital development, uh, where we have kind of a hybrid approach. And then we also stood up a, uh, a chief technology and innovation officer and made that a, a, a direct report to me as well. And so that's kind of the leadership team. And, and I'm excited where this is gonna go. I, I think it's gonna, it's already shown value. Um, and I, I think it's gonna really show value as we, as we continue to build this out. Thank you, sir. I, I, that's, uh, I, and we'll, we'll revisit this with the class, but the, that new staff organization, I think um, really is going to be a model for the other services, the COO and, CTO and, and the head of innovation are, are pretty unique. Um, and, um, uh, you know, since Raj got two, I'll ask one more and then I'll go to the students. But, but you've now had a long career through the Air Force. You've seen lots of history with uh, acquisition and, and working and not working with uh, commercial vendors. And, and it's now a new world. And, 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 and now you get to set at least some of the rules. Um, what do you think specifically are the top three things that you see Space Force doing different in innovation um, with uh, commercial partners and, and innovation internally. Can you, can you name three? Um, um, and you could pass. <laughs> I, I'll, 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 I don't know if I'll, let me, I'll put some thought on it, but I would say, first of all, one of the big things we're doing is uh, we wanna uh, do, uh, adopt digital engineering as our standard. And that's going to be a big focus area for us. And it's more than just, uh, the, you know, digital engineering of the thing. It's it's all the way from from requirements to, 
to acquisition, to the developing the capability, the testing the capability, the uh, operating the capability, we want to have that digital thread. And uh, I am not the digital engineering expert by any means. You know, in the I've stayed at the Holiday and Express type of mentality. I, I see the goodness. I've I've done a lot of a lot of, of, of reading on it and visiting people that are experts at it. And I really believe that that's uh, something that uh, uh, there's value in. Um, I think we're also looking at, at developing a relationship with industry that, uh, again, is closer than maybe the, the relationship that we can have today. It's going to require some different rules for us to operate in under. Uh, we're really focusing on pushing decision making down to the lowest level. I want I want folks managing their programs, not managing the Pentagon bureaucracy. We're really trying to delegate uh, uh, down to lower levels. And I think uh, if we do this right, uh, that will be another model for others to, to emulate. Um, you know, one of the things that you can't do if you do that is if there's a mistake, you can't you can't go out and and you know kill somebody for making a mistake. Uh, we want to be able to fail forward, uh, and we want to be able to move at speed, and that's going to require uh, pushing authorities down to the lowest level. I think you have to do that in a domain that's so big and where operations uh, happen so fast. So those are might might be some things that I'd throw out there to answer that question, Steve. Well, well, sir, that's starting to sound like a Silicon Valley company. So uh, um, we have a good shot at catching up to to our adversaries, uh, or 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 keep certainly keeping our we get to execute that. So now I'm going to um, just pass it on to some uh, some students, and uh, I will get through everybody's list hopefully. Uh, uh, but Lucas, uh, Lu Lucas, you had a question for the general about uh, about threats? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, just thank you for, for speaking yesterday. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, push you on the question of, of ASAT threats, anti-satellite threats, um, and where you see the, the primary threat coming from or a priority interest, and whether that's kinetic um, or non-kinetic or maybe maneuverable in, in, uh, in geo threats um, and, and how that relates maybe to space debris, if you have the opportunity. Yeah, I, um, I, I would say, uh, you know, it, it's a little hard on an unclassified line to, to go into to great details on that. Um, but I would say, I'm, you know, the that spectrum of threats from not, as you, as you laid out from non-kinetic to kinetic, uh, from all orbits, um, uh, are, are very, very concerning. And so, uh, largely the, the, you know, you can, you can go on, any, you know, the, the low end things like reversible jamming of GPS satellites, uh, that's not that hard to do, but the higher end threats, uh, of, of, you know, direct ascent, uh, ASATs or, or space capable uh, on orbit uh, potential uh, concerning capabilities are more higher end and, and they largely uh, today are is from are from uh, both Russia and China. But we're concerned about all those. Uh, again, our, our goal is to, to deter conflict from happening. I think the way you do that is to deter from a positional strength. And that's why the Space Force and Space Command are so important. We want to stay ahead of that growing threat. Thank you, General. Uh, I had a question from Jennifer Quarry. Jennifer, are you still online? I'm still here, Steve. I'm going to stay off of video because I got little ones in the bathtub here on the East Coast, so I apologize for that. But my question centers around cybersecurity and system security. You know, it's it's one of those things that is coming up more and more in a lot of our um, corporate, um, you know, threats, and it's always been an issue in terms of defense. Do you see differences in the domain of space in terms of um, how it may drive changes in how we approach cybersecurity, in uh, what needs we have or what priorities may change? Well, I think uh, you know one of those threats on that spectrum of, of threats is a cyber threat. And so uh, if you look at who we're bringing into the Space Force, one of the, one of the career fields that we're bringing in are cyber professionals. We need to understand the cyber train uh, uh, to be able to operate in this contested domain, we've actually uh, integrated cyber uh, uh, professionals on our operations floors as part of our crews to be able to protect uh, protect uh, 
our ability to operate. Uh, we've taken, we've, we really put a lot of focus on this over the last last few years to 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 harden ourselves uh, from any kind of cyber threat. Uh, and um, it's it's a constant constant vigilance thing for us, uh, and it's something that we take very seriously. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, Janani, uh, you had a question about elections. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us, General Raymond. Um, my question had to do with the upcoming elections. I was wondering if you think that the way that the Space Force is addressed as like a priority will change given the results of the upcoming elections, especially if there's a change in administration, and whether that could lead to any vulnerabilities in security that you think are particularly concerning. And so when the Space Force was stood up, it, it was stood up with broad bipartisan support. It's really important to our nation. Uh, uh, it, it's... Um, uh, and so uh, we're, our, we're, our focus is building this, building this service to provide advantage to our nation. And so far, we've had really good uh, bipartisan support. Okay. Thank you, General. Uh, and uh, John, you had a question about uh, uh, private space. John Mern. Yes, thank you. Thank you, General. Um, my question, I think, has been touched on a few times, so I'm going to get a little specific. Um, you know, with a lot of investment occurring in private industry and a lot focused on small companies, um, how do you see, what do you see the critical differences between evolving the relationships between uh, industry and the Space Force versus Air Force and the traditional defense industrial base, in particular um, around requirements derivation and kind of forming technical programs? Yeah, you know, so um, it is, uh, Steve was talking, uh, We've, we've really uh, worked hard over the last couple years to um, to uh, expand our defense industrial base, if you will, and to bring in partners that are that all you know, and not saying that the partners that we had aren't good. I mean, that we got the world's best industry. I'm not I'm not slamming the big guys at all. Uh, they, they provide great capabilities, but we want to we want to expand that, and and so uh, the. Uh, uh, the work we're doing with what we call spec OT that, that was talked about was trying to expand that to, to get others involved as well. Uh, we, we are looking to build uh, a space systems command that will have uh, disruptive innovators sitting side by side with, with more traditional innovators, if you will. Uh, we think there's room and value for, for all. Um, we think um, if you look at the domain and, and where it's headed and where industry is headed, that there's a lot of opportunities to come up with kind of a hybrid hybrid type of architecture, uh, not just a, a one size fits all. And we think uh, expanding that industrial base uh, is going to be important to us. And we put a lot of put a lot of effort into that over over the last uh, last couple of years. Thank you, General. Um uh, Eldridge, you had a question from uh, Jeff Vanek you wanted to pass on. Roger, so, uh, thank you very much, sir, for speaking with us. Uh, the question that was brought up was, uh, space has, be has quickly become the only domain with both a dedicated service and functional combatant command. Why are two organizations needed vice, you know, following a more SOCOM-like structure? Yeah, so first of all, um, I I'm going to, it's a great question. Uh, let me, I'm going to, Correct you to 100% on your question, though, on the functional combatant command. The, the original space command was a functional combatant command. The, the space command that we stood up uh, back in August of, of 19 was actually a geographic combatant command with an AOR that's that's assigned to it. And so that that AOR of 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface and higher uh, is uh, um, uh, is is the area of operations that it, that that is responsible for? When we were looking at uh, what you know, when the the organization was being discussed over the last couple of years on the National Security Space Organization, there were lots of different models that were that were addressed and and um, and and evaluated. And so you know, SOCOM like models where you have a combatant command that has in, in, you know some service like authorities. Uh, uh, was one of the models that that was evaluated. Uh, um, a a uh, a space core 
uh, was, was uh, I mean, there was a whole series of, of steps that are, or co as course of actions that were evaluated and what was decided on uh, to, again, to be able to move at speed and stay ahead of a, of a, of a, a growing competition in space um, was that having an independent, uh, having a service with a four star that came to work every day, focusing on organized training and equipping and providing those capabilities to a combatant commander uh, uh, to, to execute operations with was, was the, the one that would provide us the most value. And so we went through a, a series of, of analysis on all the kinds of different options and that's where it landed. I think it's the right answer. I, I really think we've got this right. Um, I, I've, I've already seen uh, significant uh, value in both uh, the combatant command and and the Space Force. If you look at the National Defense Strategy, the National mm -hmm. Defense Strategy talks about competing, deterring, and winning. And I really see the Space Force and Space Command, for that matter, as being critical uh, components of the implementation of the National Defense Strategy. But all a whole series of options were 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 evaluated over the course of the of the years leading up to this the establishment. Thank you, sir. Uh, though it uh, must have been fun writing memos to yourself. Uh, uh, from one uh, organization to another, for yeah, at least. The, it, it's interesting on a, when you're a dual-hatted as a service chief and a combatant commander, you get to write yourself a, a, a letter saying, "Hey, dummy, why did you do that?" And so it's kind of fun. Uh, but you, you, a combatant commander has a much more narrow, short-term focus. You know, kind of a, a near-term focus. He, he or she has to conduct operations today, and a service chief tends to think longer uh, and I, I want to you know build the service for the future and that that tension between near term and, and future is something that is why that 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 structure of the Department of Defense is, is so important where you have have two different two different uh, uh, two distinct functions there uh, that provide a healthy tension in uh, in the stand-up of both US Space Command and, and the Space Force when it was under one person, I think it was. I think Congress got it exactly right that that when they said that uh, the the commander of U.S. Space Command could be the service chief uh, for up to a year because when we were standing these organizations up, we were, I was able to make organization or enterprise level trades between the two organizations, and it was much easier. And now that we have those structures built and we have the staffs designed and and, and most almost all those trades are done, uh, now it's time then to to split those hats and, and get the two distinct, uh, uh, two distinct four stars with, with uh, separate focus uh, running fast. And I think, I think, again, I think Congress got it exactly right when they built that. Thank you, sir. So do I actually. And, and uh, I just wanna remind the class, the closest thing that we've looked at uh, in, in this class so far was uh, General Nakasani who runs uh, uh, both Cyber Command and a defense support uh, organization, though not a, a separate combatant command or when he runs NSA with, with his other hat is writing memos to himself as well. Um, and uh, there was a great question uh, from Lieutenant Colonel uh, Denny Davis, uh, who's uh, uh, US Air Force and also here at Stanford as a Hoover Fellow. Uh, Denny, do you wanna ask the General your question? Yeah, th thanks Mr. Blank. Thank you, uh, thank you General for your time today. Uh, I loved your tag that you said space is a war fighting domain and we must ensure deterrence in that domain. and. I hope and pray in, in, in the time you have in this position that you're able to uh, get that across to everybody in, in Washington, DC. That being said, uh, you're, you're standing this up at a time when looking out into the near future, there's the potential for flatlining budgets in the Department of Defense. Um, how do, how, can you talk to us about how, how your team is, is trying to set that appropriate budgetary framework here, here and now at the, at the infancy uh, of the Space Force so that we can ensure that space dominance uh, and, and likewise deterrence for decades into the future. And so, you know, um, we have to compete for resources just like all the other services. Uh, if you look at the, the amount of dollars though that we spend on space, it, it's, it's, if you look at the overall defense budget, it, it's, it isn't uh, small dollars, but it's nowhere near uh, the majority of the defense budget. So we're not all that, uh, we, we don't have a huge uh, percentage of that of that budget. Um, I think over the course of the last couple last several years, uh, 
with the with the recognition that that uh, space is a a contested domain, uh, and it is, you know, if you look at the national security strategy, it, it talks about assured access to and freedom to maneuver in space is a vital national interest. And I think as you look to elevate space to the level commensurate with our national security, it also requires a little bit of elevation in resources. Uh, I think uh, we have a great opportunity with all the things that we've talked about here uh, with uh, innovation and, and, and using commercial models, uh, commercial business practices to be able to do this in a way that doesn't break the bank. I think our partnerships, you know, we, we entered into a partnership with Norway, for example, uh, I've, did I mention this earlier? I, I'm sorry, I've, I've spoken this in my third talk to, this today. And I want to make sure I didn't, I haven't said this to you, but I, I don't think I have. We entered into a partnership with Norway. Norway was launching two satellites. Uh, we needed to launch uh, communication satellites. We asked them if we could put our payloads on their satellites. It saved us about $900 million uh, and, and will get us a capability on orbit faster. Uh, we're, with Japan, we're putting a hosted payload on a QZSS satellite. I was just in Japan it's a little over a month ago now, um, met with, uh, with the prime minister uh, and, uh, and uh, agreed to, to, to do this close partnership in space. Uh, we're putting a hosted payload on their satellite, which will provide space situational awareness for us. Um, and so uh, we think uh, there's ways to do this with partnerships and with uh, commercial industry that, that will give our nation what we need uh, without, um, hold on a second. Uh, that was my wife. <laughs> uh, I, I learned to just decline it so I didn't interrupt the whole car. But uh, um, where was I? I, I, we, I think there's a way to do this. Uh, and I think it's critically important to our nation that, that space is resourced. It, uh, we can do this without breaking the bank. And, and, and it provides incredible value uh, to, to the uh, Department of Defense. Just think, you know, as an example that I, I've used in the past, um, I, I, you're an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, is that right? Yes, sir. C-130 pilot by trade. So back in World War II, uh, how many bombers did we send after one target? Like a thousand uh, going after a ball bearing factory? It had, right, that, right. That thousand bombers would have, uh, you know, thousands uh, between the collective would have thousands of weapons going after one target. Um, today, that's not the case. Today, we, we take a, a, a couple bombers, if you will, and uh, strike you know, significant numbers of targets and they're all perfect, perfect hits. The way you do that is from integrating space. What if we didn't have space? Do we have a thousand bombers in our Air Force? No. And so uh, I really believe this is uh, a great value for our nation. It provides us, it fuels our American way of life. Uh, it fuels our American way of war. And I, I think it's something that uh, we have to resource and we have opportunities to do this in a way that uh, uh, we can afford. Uh, great, we're, uh, we're coming down to the last couple of questions. I know we're, uh, um, we, we've taken a lot of your time, but uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Jim Weiss had a, had a question and uh, uh, about uh, lessons uh, uh, for, that other services could take. Uh, Jim? Hey, sir. Thanks for your time. Um, other than my interest in what you thought of Steve Carell and uh, Netflix, uh, my question is really about the, uh, as you've stood up a service from the ground up and today's technology, and I'm thinking about the Army trying to revamp its personnel system. I wonder how receptive the services are and what's carrying over potentially uh, as we kind of reimagine how to fix old structures. Yeah, so uh, first of all, in the space, I get asked the Space Force Netflix show a lot. Uh, it was interesting, you know, I, one of my daughters that had just piped in on the call here a little bit ago, uh, uh, I have three children, uh, one as a teacher, third grade teacher in Des Moines, Iowa, one is a marketing manager in Minneapolis, and I've got a son who who uh, goes to Yale and is a tight end for their for their football team. Uh, and I I had there's a thing called Netflix that I was going through my bank account. I'm like, why am I paying what is it twelve dollars a month or whatever? And I said, I I you know this was a couple of years ago. I don't I don't watch Netflix and I canceled it. And within about uh, you know two point three minutes or whatever from you know, Minnesota, Iowa, and, and New Haven. Uh, hey, what happened in Netflix? And uh, 
And I said, I don't watch it. They said, Dad. And so I, you know, immediately put it back on. And then uh, uh, a couple months later, my one daughter said, Dad, I can't, you can't believe it. I mean, you're, you know, uh, Netflix is doing a show about the Space Force and Steve Carell is playing you. I said, that didn't happen. And sure enough, it, it was. And and I uh, I said, well, they picked the wrong guy because he's got too much hair. And I, I, I've said in an interview once that uh, they should have picked Bruce Willis and, and uh, it would have been a better better representation. But, you know, it just shows uh, that show, no matter what you think of the show, it shows the excitement of what uh, in the imagination that is going across the country about space. And uh, uh, I think it's going to pay dividends for us. Again, it's not just about military space. It's about all the different sectors of space. And, uh, you know, it just is when I was a little kid, I remember sitting on the, the living room floor in West Point, New York, where my dad was a teacher when I was in very young um, and watching uh, man will first walk on the moon and, and then going to the dining room table and building models, you know, Apollo models. And I think that with what we're seeing, uh, I think there's gonna be a, uh, this uh, enthusiasm for space is gonna help our, help our country. Uh, if you look across the board at schools, there's my understanding is, and, and I, I, I don't know this scientifically, I, I haven't done the, you know, the data scrub of the, if you will, but the, the schools that I have uh, engaged with here over the last, uh, last few months, have, they've all told me that their, in, their interest and their uh, uh, applications for space types of engineering things are gone up. And so I think there's value there for our country. Uh, on the what are we doing that will be uh, of value uh, for others? One of the things that, and, and so first of all, we're just beginning. And so, you know, we're just creating this. So it's probably a little early to say, what have you built that others now are, are, are emulating? We have, you know, for example, when we did the organization for space, we collapsed two layers of command. Uh, and we, in the, in the Air Force, there was what was called a major command and then a numbered air a numbered air force command and then a and so the major command was commanded by a four star the numbered air force command was commanded by a three star there was a wing commander that was commanded by a colonel there was a group commander that was commanded by a colonel and then there was a squadron commander that was commanded by a lieutenant colonel and we slashed that by two and so now you have a three star field command with a one colonel command and then a lieutenant colonel so we went from five to three uh, I think there's value. We'll see how this plays out. I know there's value to us already, and I think, and we'll see. Um, I, I believe the work that we're doing to uh, get after uh, being able to link sensor uh, shooter to shooters and having the, the, the interfaces and the standards uh, to be able to do that. Uh, and, and if you look at the challenges that we face in the space domain today, they're, they're largely big data challenges. And so um, you know, we, we track, you know, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips. It goes up, you know, routinely, but, you know, in the high twenties or 30,000 objects in space, there's probably a half a million objects that we don't track because they're, because of their size. Um, if you look at the numbers of those things that we track, historically, a small portion of those are actually satellites. Uh, though that number is growing significantly with these proliferated LEO constellations. We take you know, 400 and something observations a day to make sure that everything, uh, uh, that nothing collides in the, uh, with, the, with other uh, space objects and that we keep the domain safe. Those are all big, big data challenges. And so we've spent a lot, of, a lot of time building the data infrastructure. And you'll hear the department talk a lot about JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control. Uh, the, the data part of that was designed and built by the Space Force and that's now been integrated into JADC2. So we are already seeing uh, uh, some benefits there early on from, from the establishment of the Space Force. And I think the other thing that the Space Force does is it brings a global perspective. And this isn't anything against the other services, it's just that's just the way we operate. We, we operate in a global domain. And I think that uh, that mindset is helpful when you look at the challenges that uh, that the national de uh, defense strategy lays out. Thank you, General. And and I I, I know we're uh, just running out of your time, but I'll let uh, Joe Felter ask uh, the last question. Um, um, Joe, you can play student on this one and, and, uh, and instructor. And, and Joe, thanks so much again for sharing your insights with us. This is just really extraordinary. Um, so, John, you know, Stanford is this amazing university with amazing students, um, and 
you know, I think of people like our, our mutual friend, Matt Daniels. Um, do you have any advice for how you know, a university like Stanford could, could you know, the resources could, could be tapped more effectively to support a mission like yours? And maybe how students that are interested in getting involved in space at some level, you know, what, what paths they may, may, may take to, to, to go down to, you know, to, to, to do that? Yeah, that's a that's a, a really good question and one that uh, I know, uh, Admiral Ellis. I don't want to speak for you, but we've had a little bit of conversations on that in the past. Uh, with the other session that we that you talked about up front was was looking at. I know I'm not a Stanford expert. I know there's institutions at Stanford that that are connected to us. Uh, I do know uh, there are opportunities. Uh, uh, you know, we've got as we look at um, the you know, as we're building the service, I, if anybody wants to do a research project, I can give you, a, you know, a laundry list of, of topics where we could really use your brain bites to help us uh, think through. Uh, and I think when you graduate, uh, uh, I think there's plenty of opportunities to get into the, into the uh, space business and, and, and may get into the space business through um, uh, commercial segments that traditionally haven't been involved in the space in the space business. Uh, I think we're also looking at, uh, we'd love to have you in the Space Force. Uh, there's a lot of people that I hear, a lot of parents come up to me and say, you know, I, I wouldn't want my son or daughter to join the military, but I want them to join the Space Force. I have people say, I wouldn't want to join the whatever, but I, I want to join the Space Force. And we think there's an opportunity to tap into a broader, uh, a broader population. Uh, and and uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm excited for the opportunity to build build a relationship with Stanford. We, we're uh, we and I think there's ways to do so. so. So so thank you, General. In fact, Joe, it sounds like an opportunity at some point for you, the General, about the the buckets of uh, of centers at and in Stanford, including maybe potentially the new Gordian Knot Center that you're thinking about standing yeah, up to solve some of these problems. Even a, that, 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 absolutely, great some great opportunities. Uh, so first, let me, let me just say thanks again for allowing me to be here today. I, I uh, as I said, this is my third talk today on on a Zoom session. I'm getting way more fluent on these than I didn't even know what this was. You know, back in January or February when we, this whole thing started out. Uh, uh, but I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to, to chat with you, uh, and and uh, I hope I hope you got something out of it. I know I did. Yeah. In, in general, I, uh, you know, I, I, I think you said it, and it goes without saying. But uh, I, I think you have a part of the DoD that will uh, uh, just raise uh, everybody across the country's uh, uh, view about uh, uh, what they could add to the service to their country, and uh, as an on ramp for the image of uh, the Department of Defense. Um, it's, uh, you know, it has the excitement of NASA, but with a mission focus of uh, keeping us safe and secure um, at, at home. And uh, uh, I want to thank you for your service and, and thank you for standing up uh, an organization that, uh, as the class knows, when you, when you have something disruptive and new, that almost everybody else wants to strangle something new in its crib. And, and General Raymond has managed to, to kind of thread the needle to, to make this a, a uh, a service that's going to be long lasting and, and uh, make huge contributions to the Thank you, sir. And thank you for, uh, for your time tonight. I, I really, I really appreciate it. And uh, if you are, are interested, uh, you know, your teachers know how to get a hold of us. So I'm happy to connect you to, to our team in any way that, that uh, you want to or would be valued to you as you continue your education. And, and uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you tonight. I hope you have a good night. And I, I hope I have an opportunity uh, to see you in person, not just do this over the computer. But uh, Steve, and, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Joe, thank you. And uh, sign me up for the next one and whenever you need me. We're going to take you up on that, sir. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, and sir.